Um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm going to now present an uh, analysis of this poem as one listens to the rain by uh, Octavio Paz. Okay. Uh, a little disc uh, d a disclaimer before I even do the presentation. Uh, none of the analysis done in this video, uh, in this presentation, is from any of the sources. So, all of these are just my opinions. As I read the poem, whatever uh, you know, I could relate to, whatever uh, meaning I could derive from the words, I've just spoken it out here. Uh, which means, again, there can be uh, conflict in opinions. Everyone has their own uh, analysis and their own, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, you know, an interpretation of this poem. So, uh, what I say needn't actually be true for you. So, uh, keep that in mind and we'll proceed. Um, recently, uh, about a week back, okay, uh, I was on my way from my uh, hometown Mysore all the way to Bangalore during my vacation uh, on, on the train and it was night and, and, and the light uh, within the train in my compartment was brightly lit. And the window glasses, like I was asked to shut down the glasses. And since it's dark outside, I couldn't see what's out there because the compartment was brightly lit. Something similar to what you see right now on the screen. It's very interesting the kind of uh, sensations that it, 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 it kind of evoked in me. There was a transition. Uh, I couldn't see my reflection clearly because the glass was transparent. But the glass wasn't fully transparent so that I could see the outside clearly. So there was one layer of my reflection due to the brightly lit compartment. And there was a very faint layer of the outside as well, the passing trees, the sky, the moon, and it kind of overlapped on my face. And I found this new dimension in there, uh, a very undiscovered dimension, I would say, uh, where uh, the outside and the inside merged. Okay. You will realize why I'm saying this. Uh, this is a picture I took two days back, and this is uh, from the terrace at my home. Okay. These are those, uh, you know, the uh, cables from the television sets that, uh, you know, uh, just run around on my terrace floor. And uh, it was raining and obviously these raindrops kind of accumulated on the, on the wires, on the cables. Now again, there is another very interesting, a very beautiful kind of uh, transition state where these drops did not fall down, it did not drip down. Uh, neither was it perfectly adhered to the cables. It just stood there wobbling. It would not fall down. It would not disperse. It would not cling to the cable really hard. It would just wobble. And I was, you know, I, I had this urge to, uh, you know, uh, just see the water drop drip down. I, I just wanted it to fall. I, and it just caught my attention and I, I, I lost in a trance out there because... Uh, you know, it, it almost felt like if the drop actually drips down, it would shatter the whole universe. It was so intricately bound and so delicately hanging on those, uh, you know, uh, the, the cables. It, it, in fact, it, it actually inspired me to write a poem, uh, which I did a day later. Uh, you might have faced a, a lot of such experiences. There is another one, dreaming. This is something I've been experiencing since, uh, you know, many years. When, when I go to sleep, there is a, there is a very interesting thing that happens when, I, when, I, when I'm about to sleep. I don't fall asleep, but neither am I fully awake. I haven't started dreaming yet. Uh, I have my senses. And then there is this very, uh, you know, uh, interesting way in which my thoughts fade. It very gradually disperses. I'm thinking about something and a moment later, I don't know what I was thinking about. And it's even more pleasant if there is sound in the room where I'm sleeping. If my mom is speaking uh, to somebody on the phone, uh, her voice uh, initially in the room would, uh, you know, uh, out of nowhere start echoing in my head. You know, I can actually clearly, very clearly hear uh, and listen to what she's saying, but none of it actually makes sense. It's, it's echoing in there. It's echoing. It's as if I am within that sound. I'm, I'm enveloped in that sound. And, and the thoughts, they, they, f they merge in a very, you know, tranquilizing way. And this is again an intermediate because here neither am I sleeping nor am I awake. 
and that transition is just beautiful. Now the reason why I gave these incidents are because these are just the ones I it came the top of my head like you know a few minutes back and I just put up uh, you know these stuff on the slide. There are a lot of such relatable uh, you know experiences to each one of you I suppose uh, where uh, you would have certain uh, you know sensations which can not be explained because it's neither this nor that it's it's the middle path. And this poetry is all about that, at least according to my interpretation of the poem. Uh, the poet, uh, Octavio Paz, um, I cannot, I, I don't want to give a biography about him because you can find that online. I don't want to spend my time uh, describing his life. I would say he's, a, he's actually a Nobel laureate in literature in 1990s. <coughs> With respect to this poem, As One Listens to the Rain, I would like to call uh, Paz uh, a metaphysical poet because what he is speaking about in this poem is all about sensations. It's all about memories. It's all about, it's all about these stuff which are not tangible but they are really strong and if it's, it's more, more strong and more convincing than the tangible materials that you see around you. And uh, it, he also speaks about these transition states. So instead of speaking a lot about the poet, I would also uh, bring about another person uh, to this uh, discussion. Uh, he is a very uh, famous director. Okay, uh, I, I will tell you uh, about him. Uh, you know, in a, in a while, uh, he is an artist. Uh, he has a lot of uh, short films, uh, and in his films, there's there's a very characteristic, uh, uh, you know pattern in his films. Uh, he has a single frame shot okay, where certain events happen and they are in this transition state. They ha they tend, you expect them to happen but they just don't happen. Uh, one example is uh, you know a seagull's egg. It would just stay there. The egg, I mean there's, there's a seashore and then there are these eggs at the very edge of the seashore. They would neither uh, you know fall down, they would neither uh, just stay there firmly they would just wobble at the very uh, edge. Okay, another film of his, uh, you know, a, a short film. Uh, all of these are experimental, uh, you know. Most of these are, uh, uh, what do you say, video installations. Uh, there is a, there's a plastic water bottle and there's a beach and, and the bottle is in one of those waves. The waves neither takes the bottle away nor does it throw the bottle to the shore. The bottle just remains there. Every time the wave is, you know, flapping by, the, the water bottle would just come to the shore, then again get pulled back. So think about all these beautiful transitions that happen, uh, you know, uh, in our lives that we see, uh, you know, around us. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of them, uh, they're not always pleasant as well. Sometimes it just makes you restless because things just don't happen. Uh, but they're beautiful and, and, and if you are actually a very good observant, uh, you know, you could, you could bring in a lot of meaning for such events. This is the poem. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Uh, you may pause the video and read the poem. Uh, I will go for the line by line description of the poem. And I'm repeating myself again. I did not refer to, uh, you know, uh, any other interpretations. I didn't want that to influence my way of thinking, uh, you know, about this poem. So you will definitely have, uh, you know, maybe other interpretations as well. This is just what I think it is. Okay, it might be totally different from, uh, you know, what you think. So the first two lines say, listen to me as one listens to the rain, not attentive, not distracted. Since there is the word rain, uh, there are a few things we can actually claim about the theme of the poem. Uh, the first thing that comes to our mind is the very literal theme. You know, the poet is asking us to listen to it. The poet is begging us to listen to what he's trying to say. Probably that would mean the poet is asking us to read his poem. And there is a very specific way in which he wants us to read his poem or listen to it. He wants us to read it or listen to it as we listen to the inn. Okay, not attentive, not distracted. Another interpretation for this theme could mean uh, that the poet wants us or the poet is actually trying to romanticize the inn, or in a way he's trying to romanticize nature. And there are a lot of instances in this poem where we come across a uh, you know, very clear uh, description that's purely to convince the readers uh, how beautiful the nature is. 
okay or the poet probably doesn't want us to listen to him at all he just wants just wants us to listen to the vein itself you know listen to nature sense these very sensitive delights in the nature he asks us to listen to the uh, listen to him uh, not attentive and not distracted uh, perhaps here attentive means uh, listening with an effort you know trying to pay attention trying to understand what he's saying you know uh, like for instance how some of you might be listening to me as i'm talking you know you listen you actually derive a meaning and and, and you pay attention to what uh, you know somebody is saying uh, maybe when you are listening distracted, you are ignoring the person altogether. You don't even know the person is speaking. You don't even know that sound is coming out there. No, you're completely ignorant about it. Right? Now, he wants us to be in a transition state. He doesn't want, he doesn't want us to ignore the, uh, the po the, ignore the poem or ignore the sound of the rain totally. Neither does he want us to put effort and listen and analyze and, uh, you know, elaborate on this. He just wants to uh, wants us to listen without effort, and and the first thing that strikes into my mind when I say listen without effort is, uh, you know, listening spontaneously. We are kind of gifted with with the the the, the sense of hearing. Uh, our ears it hears a lot of things. I mean, we come across a lot of sounds, speeches, uh, you know, uh, and there's also this thing called the ear worm. So. Your ear and your mind is actually making up noises itself and you're actually listening to yourself within your head. And all of these are so beautiful, you just don't have to put in effort. At times, it just spontaneously happens. Spontaneously, sound just enters into your ears. And that's pleasurable. And he wants us to listen to him without any effort. He wants us to have a spontaneous listening. If it's raining out there, you don't really pay attention to the sound because that isn't a music to most of us. But you still notice that sound. What kind of a noticing is that? You just there is a sound, and you are at your own. You are in your own universe, but the sound has an influence on you, and he wants this poem to have a similar influence on a reader, you know, the way the rain has an influence on us. Light footsteps, thin drizzle, water that is air, air that is time. Here the light footsteps and the, th the thin drizzle, it's, it's all about delicacy. He's trying to, uh, you know, probably show us how delicate the nature is, how delicate the rain is. Rain could actually be a, a metaphor for the nature itself, you know, a collective term for the nature. Rain could be a representative of the nature. He wants us to know how delicate it is. And he's personifying rain with footsteps. Droplets of rain that is actually dripping into puddles and, and, and then these puddles actually have a ripple. It's, it's like little children actually walking on these puddles. And he's trying to personify the, the drops of rain as footsteps. And he calls it thin drizzle. He's always emphasizing on this delicacy, this tenderness. <coughs> Water that is air and air that is time. This is a very interesting, uh, you know, th there's a very interesting take on this. Uh, one thing uh, which I which ca I came up with is, uh, you know, the omnipresence of rain or the omnipresence of water itself. Water that is air, uh, you know, water exists as water vapors and moisture in the air. Uh, we call that humidity, right? And no matter how dry the region is, there would still be some amount of water vapors in the air. And how does air exist? Air exists across space. I mean, you couldn't think of a place where there is no air. So uh, basically, uh, here the, the, the theme discussed is the omnipresence of, uh, you know, water or rain. It's present everywhere and it's present at all times. There is no time when there wasn't any air. Uh, you can't even think about a future without air and air has water in it. You're talking about this water, or in other words, the nature being present in all spaces, in all times. Okay? And here, air has a very, uh, you know, significant uh, uh, analogy as well. Air could probably be an analogy to uh, universality. As, uh, as in to say that rain or water or nature is universal. Okay? It's, it's something which all of us should understand and should sense and should observe and should appreciate 
and it's present across space time right and the space itself is uh, dispersed in a very beautiful way i mean air isn't very dense and collected in a room i mean air is present everywhere and it's dispersed it's it's spread across and that is probably how you know nature is the next line says uh, the day is still leaving the night has yet to arrive another very beautiful transition just like my reflection analogy or oh, even over here you can you can say that uh, you know it's it's dusk the day is still leaving but night has yet to arrive and it's it's, it's a very beautiful time uh, you know in the 24 hours this is a time when the birds return home this is the time when uh perhaps it's it's really calm uh, out there it is the time when you see all kinds of shades and all kinds of colors and uh, diversities in in the, in the sky and in the land and just think about an evening rain that's perhaps the most beautiful of all rains you know of all times of a day i i, I would say an evening rain is the most pleasant it it cools down and calms down the the night it also gives a very beautiful closure to the day this day night transition as i said it's a again a representation of a middle path uh, now i would like to actually emphasize a little bit on this theory of the middle path itself the transition we have so far spoken about the romanticism how beautiful it is how pleasurable it is but there's also a lot of philosophies which connect to the middle path right neither this nor that neither black nor white now one such example is uh, recently i was studying about buddhism the very core principles of buddhism and and uh, you know it's it's about middle path nothing is either good or bad so here day and night could actually mean good and bad as well you know all kinds of binaries they didn't actually uh, you know be anything specific it's just binaries the yin and the yang if you're familiar with it like the chinese philosophical binaries yin and yang so uh here uh, perhaps uh, there is a very beautiful emphasis on how important these these uh, opposites are and how there exists a merging of the opposites how the binaries merge together and how beautiful it is you didn't always think about uh, you know a day and a night you you might also think about a evening not not even a evening because even a evening is ultimately a day i'm talking about that moment Now that second when it's neither the day nor the night, when that 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 amount of attention where you are neither putting an effort to listen nor you are ignoring the sound totally. These merging of two opposites have very pleasant effect, and and uh, you know even in a philosophical point of view, uh, one one is expected to lead a lifestyle where these. uh you know transitions are uh, you know embraced these these transitions are uh, appreciated and one's life is full of these transitions <coughs> the next stanza uh it's a beautiful stanza it, it says i mean actually this poetry doesn't have stanza if you think about it i just divided it into meaningful set of lines okay figurations of mist at, at the turn of a corner uh, figurations of time at the bend in this pause here the mist is uh, you know a, a physical representation okay figurations of the mist mist has various shapes right it it uh, it comes out as clouds now here the mist could also mean the little droplets that's bouncing off as the rain is being like uh, as the rain is pouring down you you might have seen in this heavy downpours you know there's actually a huge cloud of water uh, you know somewhere at the level of your knees this this cloud is a mist it's just those bounced off uh, you know uh, tiny little droplets of water okay that's perhaps what is being discussed about here figurations of mist they form figures they form uh, you know uh, sh- they, they take up shapes based on your imagination now that is present at the turn of the corner that is present at the uh, that's that's present right in front of me but there's another kind of figuration here a figuration of time you know how you pictureize and visualize and associate with time and that is present at the bend in this pause as in that is present metaphysically i cannot say this is a figure of time that that is where time is time is present everywhere time is not present itself it's it's present in a very metaphysical uh, fashion so that's that's another you could also say this is another transition a uh, mist and time you know mist and time kind of colliding each other 
miss being physically present and time being not present and both of them overlapping in the same space but in different dimensions with different perceptions. These lines, uh, again, there is also another uh, interesting uh, poetic device over here used, that is a uh, repetition. I'll come to this at the end of the poem, but uh, it repeats with the first line. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Without listening, hear what I say. With eyes open, inwards, asleep, with all five senses awake. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Uh, without listening, hear what I say. Here there's another difference. We, we speak about listening and hearing. And we have come across this a lot of, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of scenarios, uh, you know, in, in the classroom itself, all our teachers are always asking us to listen, not hear. Don't hear what I'm saying. Listen to me. Right? What, is, what exactly is the difference between listening and hearing? Perhaps this is again uh, what we have, uh, you know, spoken uh, what we spoke about in the first line itself. Listening could be with effort and hearing could be without effort. Hearing doesn't mean you are ignoring it. The sound is still getting into you, but you just don't make sense of it. Listening involves you decrypting a sound to an actual meaning. So if I'm speaking to you right now, my language and my speech is decrypted into your brain and, and, and you make sense of it. You make meanings, you make assumptions and comments and you know, uh, all sorts of interpretations. That is listening. You have to pay attention and you have to find a meaning for it. Hearing, on the other hand, is something you do with sounds, something you do with music. You don't have to listen to it. You don't have to associate a meaning to it. It doesn't have to be decrypted. And hence, you don't have to pay attention to it. You don't have to put any effort into listening to it. Hearing happens spontaneously and it's, it's more pleasurable than listening. When somebody is talking to you, you would listen to that person because you need to make sense of what he's saying. But when you listen to these sounds and musics, uh, like music, you, you don't listen to it, you hear to it. Now, does rain talk? If it doesn't, how can you listen to rain? Can you ever listen to rain? Or for that matter, can you ever listen to anything which is, uh, you know, perhaps in, in, in the realm of nature? Because nature is filled with these metaphysical states which can only be heard. It cannot be listened. You can't really make meaning out of it. These are just random beauties out there. You have to perceive it by hearing to it, not listening to it. Because rain doesn't talk. Rain is just a sound. For some people, it's music. You hear to it. Now, what happens when you hear to rain? With eyes open inwards asleep, with all five senses awake, rain tranquilizes you. You hear to the in and it puts you to sleep. But what kind of a sleep is it? It's not the kind of the, the usual kind of sleep you you, you know uh, of, uh, you do uh, at night. It's, it's a different kind of a sleep. It's a sleep of self-introspection. Your eyes are open inwards. As in you close your eyes but your eyelids are open inwards. You're actually seeing yourself. You're, you're seeing yourself Perhaps not in the middle, in a more realistic way. You're actually seeing yourself by taking out your eyes and focusing it on you. And that is why your senses are awake. You're not asleep. You're not dead. You still have the senses. These senses are awake and the senses are working their machinery to help you introspect yourself, to help you understand yourself. And this brings me to another question. Do we ever sleep? What do you mean by sleeping? If you mean sleeping, you know, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon where your senses are numb and you close your eyes. That kind of contradicts, isn't it? Because once our eyelids are closed, we just know that the eyelids are closed. We don't know what happens to our vision. And I say vision, I don't mean the physical vision. I mean the mental vision. What happens when you sleep? You see dreams. What kind? What exactly is this dream then? Is dream a language of within? a language of self. Perhaps you are seeing yourself in a dream. You are introspecting yourself with all of your senses awake. But it's happening in another world. It's, it's not happening in the physical world around you. That is why you cannot interact with it all time. You just, you have to turn your eyes towards yourself. You know, turn your eyes inwards. 
and then you kind of wake up. That's that's like a real waking up. I, uh, perhaps all of this is a dream. Perhaps our real life, our, our day-to-day lifestyle is a dream and perhaps we actually wake up when we fall asleep because that's when we see ourselves. That is when our senses are truly awake and our senses are used to its full potential to uh, you know uh, perceive ourselves, to introspect ourselves. That is our real motive, isn't it? So are we just asleep right now and when we go to bed, do we actually wake up? It's beautiful if you think about it that way. This line again, uh, it, it has a very uh, like uh, you know metaphorical meaning for me. It says uh, it's rain, it's raining, light footsteps, a murmur of syllables, air and water, words with no weight. Here, uh, I again try to understand this first line, perceive this first line as a personification of rain. But this time, the personification is different. It's more specific. Rain has light footsteps, and it gives murmur of syllables. For me, somehow it just reminded me of a newborn, a baby. Rain is like this little baby because it has little footsteps, you know, like you see in that baby. And the murmur of syllables. Rain isn't able to talk, but it's very musical. You're actually, you're forced to, you you love hearing to it. But does it actually talk to you? Are you able to make any meaning out of it? Then what kind of sound is that? It's a murmur of syllables. Have you seen children, babies speak? They don't actually speak, right? They do all this gibberish. Perhaps that gibberish is what the rain is doing. It's giving you murmur of syllables. And if 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 I if I go in this train of thought, you know, if I try to assume that, uh, you know, according to this 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 line, rain is a metaphor of, uh, you know, uh, it, the rain is a, is a, is being metaphorized as a baby, a newborn. Then rain can actually be an analogy for tenderness and freshness because a baby has been known, a newborn, a new baby is fresh and tender to this world. It's exploring this world for the first time and that is perhaps what rain does. It comes all the way from the sky and explores the earth for the first time. So and, and also it spreads around a, uh, you know, a cloud of tenderness and freshness. Everything becomes so pure and so clean and so spiritual after it's, it's, it has rained. Right? You go out in the street, uh, go out in the streets. Uh, there's this one essay I, I, I just remembered now, uh, Arhan Pamuk's Other Colors. Uh, in the, that's a collection of his essays. In that there's one rain, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's this one essay, I'm so sorry. There's this one essay. It's called uh, After the Rain. And, and it speaks about how fresh everything becomes after raining. And that is perhaps the very role of a rain, you know, uh, uh, rain is supposed to make things fresh and tender, just like how a newborn baby makes, you know, everyone so cheerful and, you know, everyone so nostalgic. The next line says, uh, air and water, words with no weight. Like the murmur, uh, the murmur of syllables of a little baby, like this gibberish of a little baby, rain has, the rain is speaking out these words which has no weight. Here, weight means a lot of things. Uh, one thing is, weight could mean consequences. You say something and it has a consequence. It could be positive or like in most cases, it's detrimental. You say something and it hurts somebody. You say something which you're not supposed to say. Either you're brutally honest or you're lying. You know, everything that we say is one or the other way ethically wrong. Right? Can we ever make everyone happy? Not possible, right? So whatever we do in our actions and in our speech, there is consequences. But that's not the case with a baby because a baby is innocent. A newborn is innocent. It's it's we don't really you know have I mean we don't really even consider what it's trying to say. Its words have no weight, no consequences, which means there's a, there's a freedom, and similarly rain has a freedom. It has a freedom of speech. It can say things which will just make people happy. It will never make anybody sad. How utopic is that? Uh, weight could also mean, uh, you know, other, uh, uh, you know, uh, metaphysical pain such as burden, stress, pressure, sorrow. Because all these are considered as, uh, you know, heavy, right? When I, when I say my heart is, uh, uh, you know, worn down with sorrow, 
No, I have a lot of burden and pressure. These literally mean heavy. Pressure means heavy. Burden means heavy. And what happens when it rains? Perhaps rain, uh, you know, in a way, uh, it, it, it kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, it cures, you know, it heals all your burden and pressure and your stress. You know, it, it's in a way a relaxative. It, it, it makes you calm and it, it cures all your stress. That could be one way of thinking about it. <clears throat> now, we could also think about the physical weight. When, when the line says, words without weight, uh, I might think about the physical weight. Rain doesn't have physical weight and that is why it's floating. And when I say it's floating, I mean, uh, you know, in, in, in a more poetic sense, uh, you know, the spreading of rain itself. Like how I said, rain is dispersed. Rain is present everywhere across space and time. And what helps it disperse in that way? It's weightlessness. Okay. This again emphasizes on weight, uh, or at least for me, it, it reminded me of the same as uh, something very similar to the previous stanza. It says, what we are and are, the days and years, this moment, weightless time and heavy sorrow. For now, we have one thing in our mind, that time is weightless. And also time is independent, because it says what we are and are. We are what we are. We are not, I mean, if you think about we as time here, time is independent. It's not affected by space. It's not affected by people. It's not affected by events because time actually kind of makes these events happen, right? It's independent. And the next line is very, uh, you know, convincing. It says, the days and years, this moment, moments add up to give you days, days add up to give you years. If I think about time as an additive, right? It's adding up moments. It's adding up, uh, you know, all the experiences or all, all your, uh, you know, associations or all, all your uh, senses, you know, whatever you're coming across, you know, in, in your life is being added up by time. If it adds up all this, along with that, it also adds up your pleasure. Time also adds up your stress, your burdens, your pains, your sorrow, your all your bad memories. And hence, it adds up weight. Right? Time adds up weight, but time itself is weightless. So that is why I made a pictorial representation here. This is time. Perhaps time is like a blanket. Time is like a you know sheet of like 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 a you know a, a piece of cloth. Okay, and it it is weightless, but it adds up weight. Your sorrow is heavy, and across time, from moments to days to years, and throughout your lifetime, you have you you face a lot of sorrows, which are added up by the time, and it's it starts weighing down the time itself. Time is weightless, but it has this dip, and this could this is actually your sorrow out there. Sa your sorrow weighs down time, right? So, think about all the positive, or, or all the you know supernatural powers of time. Time isn't affected by any of this, but it is clever enough to you know actually make us experience all this by adding up all our weights. That is why time is personalized. My time is mine. It adds up my sorrows. It adds up my weights. You know, my time could be heavier than somebody else's. Time itself is weightless. This line, uh, again, it starts with the repetition. Listen to me as one listens to the rain. Wet asphalt, uh, wet, sorry, wet asphalt is shining. Uh, I googled up and I got to know that asphalt here means, uh, you know, tar or road. When it's raining, the road is wet. And have you noticed this tar roads which are wet and, and, and the you look at it from a far off distance, especially when there's a street light or something and you see that it's shining, you know, because it reflects light. So that's literally what it means, wet roads which are shining. The next line has a very, uh, you know, again, a very metaphorical meaning. It says, steam raises and walks away, night unfolds and looks at me. It's, it's speaking about uh, this poet, uh, you know, Octavia Paz's uh, skill of communicating with the nature. 
he says steam rises and walks away. He is literally personifying steam as a person, a human being, who raises from this, uh, you know, wet road. What happens when it's shining, uh, you know, when, when there is sun shining on the wet road, the road is wet, the sun is shining on it and hence the road is reflecting and it's all bright. After a while, this water evaporates. The road becomes dry, the water evaporates and the steam raises and walks away. It leaves the place. Physically or literally, that's what it means. Night unfolds and looks at me. This has perhaps happened in the daytime. Probably it, it has rained in the afternoon. By evening, sun, sun is able to uh, you know, completely evaporate the water and along with it, it's evaporated all of the all of these metaphysical properties of rain that we spoke about in the previous slide. And then night unfolds and looks at me. There's another fresh beginning. So rain gives you a very beautiful closure and then it just leaves and then another story begins at night. These three lines they have tremendous amount of uh, you know uh, meaning hidden in it at least according to me again you are you and your body of steam you are your face of uh, face of night you are your hair unhurried lightning <coughs> here the word you could have two different meanings okay i will look at each of it uh, and and will think which one uh, is more suitable here, the word you could actually refer to rain. Probably the poet is speaking to the rain. Probably he is he's describing rain to me. So in that way, uh, you know, uh, you here refers to rain. And when I say you are you and your body of steam, it's, it's, it literally means rain. So rain is the rain that pours down and the rain in the form of water vapors. Okay, rain or water pours down by its physical familiar form, the form that we are all familiar with, the pouring down of the rain, and the body of steam, the, the water vapors. You are your face of night. Probably refers to rain, which is, I mean, the, the, the scene of the raining in the night thing. Okay, and you are your hair, unhurried lightning. It's probably referring to, uh, you know, lightning. Uh, it's trying to personify and metaphorize this lightning as hair. Of the rain okay so uh, perhaps uh, lightning is personified as a part of the rain that is its hair because because uh, you know if you think about the whole this is also something very evident in uh, you know various Western mythologies you know you think about Greek mythology and Roman mythology people found it comfortable to give uh, you know personify God uh, and personify rather nature to God humanize nature they could think about Earth as a woman, Gaia. They could think about the cosmos as as a man, Uranus. Okay. So similarly, uh, I mean that's that's more comfortable. We we are all anth uh, you know anthropogenic. We uh, we find it uh, you know more convincing if we see inanimate things by animating them to human beings, and that is a a, a very desperate attempt is done here uh, when he, uh, when the poet says you know that. Lightning is perhaps the hair of the rain. But another meaning for this could be with respect to, uh, you know, my opinion that uh, you here stands for the reader. You are literally you, the one who is listening to me. You are the you that's being referred to. In that case, it gives you a totally different meaning. It says you are you and your body of steam. Here, uh, the you refers to your physical self. You are who you are, what you are, uh, you know, perceiving yourself as, what everyone else think about you as. But there's also your metaphysical self, your physical self, the person that you appear to be, right? As you're sitting and watching this video, the person you are, that is your physical self and your body of steam. Can you touch steam? Steam is not tangible. Steam or gas, it exists, but you can't really touch it or feel it. That's metaphysical. Similarly, your body also has a metaphysical self. You have a metaphysical identity that is comprised of your memories, your experiences, your associations, your sensations, your sensitivity, your, your affinities. All of these make your metaphysical identity and together that makes it you. So there is your physical self that everyone uh, you know, knows and there is your metaphysical self that perhaps you know, at rare cases even you don't know about. You are 
you and your face of night. Now this again speaks about your second identity. Night here refers to darkness. Can you see things at night clearly? Perhaps not. You are the face of night. When I say you are face of night, uh, perhaps what uh, the poet is trying to say is, uh, you know, he's trying to point out at your hidden face, your face in the dark, your face which nobody has seen. That is perhaps the face which only you know about. Right? So you are comprised of a lot of personalities. You have your physical self. You have your metaphysical self which even you don't know about. Then you have your face which only you know about and nobody else does. Your face in the darkness. Your face when nobody else is observing you. Your, perhaps your true identity. And the last line, uh, you know, uh, it says, uh, your hair, uh, unhurried lightning. Uh, there's a little uh, discrepancy here. For me at least, I think here uh, hair is referring to complexities and intricacies. Uh, this is something which I use even in my poetry and my writing. When I say hair, I refer to, maybe hair for me is like roots, you know, it's, it's or branches. It's, it's very complex. Out there, it's, it's like a dense forest. And similarly, that is the case, uh, you know, like that is, that is the stuff inside our head as well. You know, our brain, our thoughts, our, our uh, you know, uh, thinking and interpretation is very complex. Similar to the hair in here. It's, it's, it's huge in number. It's branching. It's interwining, twisting with each other. And it's very complex, like an unhurried lightning. So it could probably be, uh, you know, all your hidden complexities and intricacies. Your, uh, you know, like a very dense root branching in your head. Right? Uh, you know, all the mysteries about you. So all of this is what makes you who you are. Your physical self, metaphysical self, your face in the darkness and your, uh, you know, complexities and intricacies, your, your dense roots within you. <coughs> this line says, You cross the street and enter my forehead, steps of water across my eyes. It has a very interesting take on it. So far we have been looking at rain with respect to hearing the rain you know the poet is asking us to listen to the rain we we have uh, you know uh, emphasized so much about the sound of rain how it sounds now we have taken this relationship one step forward now you can no longer listen to the rain you can actually see rain and when i say see rain uh, it doesn't physically mean uh, you know you looking at the rain from out your window it means rain is inside your eyes. The rain has crossed the street and it has entered your forehead. Forehead here refers to mind. Your, inside your head, basically. So, uh, rain is no longer out there in the streets. Now it is more personalized. It has entered within you. And now your thoughts are all about rain. Your thoughts have superposed itself on the nature. And the nature has super, superposed itself in your thoughts. The steps of water across my eyes. Footsteps of water. Here, now now, now, what is happening? Basically, rain or, or nature for that matter is inside your eyes. When I say inside your eyes, you aren't really seeing rain physically. Rain is just there. Even if you close your eyes, you can actually see rain. This is an everlasting dispersed mood of rain. Rain might stop. Maybe rain... What if there is no rain at all? What if the rain has stopped an hour ago? But the rain is still in your thoughts. You can still see rain. You can still listen to rain without rain actually being there. Because now it's entered your mind. You have found this connection. You know, you've you formed this relationship with nature. You know, in, in, in an undestructible bound. So now you can actually, I mean, you, you are able to physically experience nature even in the absence of nature itself. It's inside your eyes. It's walking across inside within your eyes. Now we are looking at three senses, uh, you know, three stages of your relationship with nature. You first listen to nature, then you see nature. In the next to next uh, line, we will be looking at, uh, you know, how you can sense rain. How it, uh, you know, captures you uh, a step forward. It starts, you start feeling rain. So that's another thing we'll talk about in the next to next line. So again, as I said, this can be physical and metaphysical. The rain has physically entered your eyes. So that now, even if you close your eyes, you can actually see rain, right? And the rain is metaphysical. It is within your head. You are not actually seeing the rain out there on the streets. 
perhaps the rain has already stopped but it hasn't stopped raining in your head it's right there inside right now these line again has a you know it has in fact two repetitions it says listen to me as one listen to the rain the asphalt shining you cross the street repetition both the lines the road is shining because it's raining and now the rain crosses the street the rain crosses the street it is the mist wandering in the night it is the night asleep in your bed it is the surge of waves in your breath i look at it as levels of calmness when you are sleeping there are there is a lot of entropy there is a lot of disturbances and gradually things calm down gradually things settle down it is the mist wandering in the night initially uh, you know when 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 you for, for for instance if i consider night as a metaphor of sleep and if i consider mist as a metaphor of dream why because we often say right that dreams are misty dreams don't have a very definite storyline it doesn't have a very definite reality it's not even magical realism dream is misty it's it's just spread across it has no meaning so mist appears in the night similar to how dream appears in your sleep so when you are asleep mist is wandering mist is wandering in the night or your dreams are wandering in your sleep are you peaceful right now not really because you are physically asleep but your dreams are wandering within you and the night that is your sleep on your bed your sleep is sleeping on your bed it is a surge of waves in your breath now what happens when this mist wanders what happens when your 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 dream wanders in your sleep you are not calm enough you know you you have this disturbance and that is a surge of waves in your breath your breathing isn't uh, you know calm it's it's is it isn't stable there is a surge of waves like an ocean like 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 a flood you know like like a typhoon your breathing unevenly so it speaks about levels of calmness how how it is how you are disturbed even though uh, you know uh, for somebody looking at you outside you are actually peacefully sleeping how you are disturbed from within now this is where i i spoke about the third stage of experience the first stage was listening to the rain the second stage was seeing the rain now this is the third stage where you are feeling the rain you actually have sensation of the fingers of water like fingers of water in the sense now the rain has become tangible to you you know it's a very tangible love that you have with your rain a tangible relationship you can actually feel rain as fingers and they're trying to calm you down the, the the fingers of water dampen my forehead forehead here again has a lot of stress you have headache because you you know you have burdens and you have oh, tensions and worries and and you you're disappointed and you have all these uh, you know disturbances and what does rain do it has these fingers that dampen your forehead and in a way it cures or calms you down it it's it's like a tranquilizer then what happens there's there's a lot of things this uh, you know this rain does as it touches you the touch of the rain has a lot of effects the fingers dampen your forehead and the fingers of flame burn my eyes why do you think you should burn like why, why would rain burn your eyes and look at the next line it says the fingers of air opens the eyelid of time why is it that your eye your eyes are burnt but then your eyelids of time is open what does this mean so why do we use eye in the first place to observe things but what are we observing are we observing the sensitive uh, you know metaphysical uh, philosophical uh, you know uh, uh, entities that i spoke about not really with our eyes we only observe what is physical and whatever is uh, what whatever is visible physically they are not always peaceful you know often what we see around us is very painful right it's it's not really a very uh, you know pleasant sight so that is why uh, you know this rain burns your eyes it relieves you from all the stress and all the all the uh, you know uh, unpleasant things that you see with your physical eyes and once all your unpleasant visions are burnt away and and the whole thing is washed afresh your eyelids of time open this is your metaphysical eye 
This is an eye that only sees goodness. This is an eye that can perceive sensitivity of a nature. Now you are able to truly see rain because your eyelids of time is opened. Like time, this thing doesn't. This, these these eyes are, aren't tangible. These eyes aren't really present physically. But these eyes can see time because time is metaphysical. So rain burns your physical eyes, but it awakens or opens your metaphysical eyes. And what happens when the metaphysical eye opens? A spring of visions, resurrections. What you see is a lot of visions and resurrections. Resurrections here refers to perhaps all the happy things which have passed away. A lot of happy things you would have bid farewell, you, you would have said, uh, said goodbye to. Because, you know, uh, all the physical happiness is limited. But once your physical happiness is totally burnt away, your metaphysical happiness is now very clearly visible. A spring of happiness and positive vision, you, you know, all of a sudden see sprouting around you. The resurrection here could literally mean the water cycle, the universality of rain. Rain resurrects, right? It falls down, it vaporizes, goes back and then again comes down. And similarly, all your happiness gets resurrected when your eyelids of time opens. The next line says, uh, again there's a repetition, it says, Listen to me as one listens to rain, the years go by, the moments return. Uh, there's a whole new perspective to this line. Years go by, the moments return. Uh, to me, I don't know, I mean this is very personalized, when I read this line, to me, I think about associations of rain to other moments. For me, uh, there are certain things like books, music. I associate these with certain experiences. If, I ha if I'm having a very good time, and if I'm reading a book, for me, that book is associated with that beautiful experience. Now, in the next time, maybe in the near future when I read that book again, I remember or recall that beautiful, pleasant experience. Similarly, when I'm listening to music, I usually listen to music when I'm on journey, right? You know, when I'm traveling. Now, what happens is, uh, you know, one fine day when I'm at home and I'm listening to that same music, the journey actually is recalled. I can actually feel myself traveling again just by listening to that music. Years go by, but the moments return. Similarly, rain does a very similar thing. You know, rain, uh, you know, you associate rain to a lot of pleasant experiences, maybe at one point of time. And in another point of time, uh, when it rains again, all the pleasant associations come back. That is one thing I, uh, you know, looked at. But there's also another thing. Years go by, but moments return. Perhaps here the rain is spoken about in a very physical sense. Now this brings us to another question. Are we really talking about rain? Because it isn't mentioned here. Years go by, the moments return. What moments? What years? We, th there is nothing mentioned here. Is this speaking about the poetry itself? Is it speaking about the poet? Is the poet speaking about you? What if this is a person? Years go by, but when it rains again, you recollect, an, uh, you recollect a person. Rain for you now has become a person. For you, rain has become a person. Or perhaps, a person is now rain for you. You have, uh, you know, uh, you, you have uh, associated a person with rain. And now these two associations are inseparable. Whenever it rains, you think about that moment or that experience or that person. And whenever you see that person or you feel that experience, you think about rain. They have become inseparable. Uh, this line says, Do you hear the footsteps in the next room? Not here, not there. You hear them in another time that is now. Do you hear the footsteps in the next room? Perhaps the question is, are you sensitive enough? Are you listening to that footstep? In the next room, where is that room? The room isn't here. The room is not physically present. It's in another time that is now. It's in another parallel universe. Perhaps a universe which is more peaceful. A universe that is more, uh, you know, uh, uh, that demands more sensitivity. And that is why, uh, you know, the poet wants to ask you, are you sensitive enough to see that? Are you just romanticizing superficially or are you really sensitive enough to actually feel that? To actually listen to that footstep in, in the same room, maybe in another time. And when I say the same room in another time, I, I'm, I'm talking about spatial freedom of time. 
because time exists across parallel dimensions across parallel universes across uh, you know alternate sequences there is a time here there is also a time right there where you are listening to my video uh, there is also a time somewhere in another part of the universe time is running independent of all these obstacles because time is spatially free time can travel in parallel universes if i have my universe if there is another universe which is more peaceful time travels in both of them simultaneously the same time travels together in both of them and the poet wants you to be spaceless the poet wants you to be spatially free just like time so that you can sense time can you sense or can you visualize or can you uh, you know uh, apprehend the spatial freedom of time can you fathom the spatial freedom of time that is the question listen to the footsteps of time here again the footsteps of time refers to time across past present and future okay all the time that that there is right the time from the past time from the future time you know time present uh, there is there is this famous uh, line which one of my teacher keeps repeating to me time past and time present are perhaps contained in time future which is a part of time past so time past present and future is all mixed up we are the ones who are actually distinguishing it it's indistinguishable it's it's just one flow of uh, you know uh, you know an entity and he wants you to listen to this footsteps of time or the poet wants you to understand the past the present and the future to acquire sensitivity so that you can understand the past the present and the future so for that uh, again as i said there is no physical existence of time time is spaceless it doesn't have a physical existence it is free from space it is not bound with space it ha it has a spatial freedom now you have to acquire sensitivity so that you can become spatially free so that you can become i mean so that you so that you are able to perceive this footsteps of time and he describes time in a very beautiful way he he says that time is inventor of places with no weight nowhere the place is nowhere because this, the place is spaceless time is present nowhere because it's present everywhere time doesn't occupy space it's not bound by walls so it is nowhere it is spread across everything that there is and it has no weight that we spoke about earlier as well time is not influenced by any of the you know anything that you could think of it's weightless and it's it's spaceless he is asking you he 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 wants you to detect time he wants you to acquire the sensitivity so that you could perceive this time there are two ways in which time can be perceived a normal human being could perceive time with respect to movement when something moves we know that time has passed just imagine you don't have a watch what if you do not have a clock at all how would you perceive time by movement right when, when i say movement i literally mean uh, you know somebody walking you know a, a, a car or the bike moving that is how we detect time but a more sensitive way of detecting time would be with respect to time itself you are not detecting time relative to another uh, you know entity you are detecting time with respect to time itself you are looking at time you are seeing time in real time you are actually visualizing time as it moves you don't need another media to actually observe or feel time because you know time for what it is <laughs> this line says listen to the rain uh, running over the terrace the night is now more night in the groove uh here the terrace for me refers to uh, you know an anthropologic uh, destruction of nature terrace is a man made structure it, it is the top uh, it is the roof of your house something that you have built it's man made it's it's not natural it's it's artificial and then it says night is now more night in the groove groove over here refers to a tiny maybe a tiny uh, gap you know uh, a tiny gap in any of the structures any of any a tiny crack in the wall perhaps it's more dark over there right here when i say more night uh, when 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 the poet says night is more night 
it's perhaps referring to uh, you know night being more peaceful night itself is peaceful but it's more peaceful in this group it's more dark in this group when i say it's more dark right what i mean is it's more real and more natural light is considered artificial light is something which we have done you're talking about night night is meant to be dark night doesn't have to be lit up there is sun to light up the day night is meant to be dark right but still uh, you know we light up things we we have terraces we we have uh, you know all our uh, human structures have destroyed nature but there is this tiny group where you know we haven't really been able to light it up yet it's still dark it's still real and it's still natural there is this connection of nature in this group the group has got nature in it and the terrace or the man made structures have destroyed it now what happens rain flows into the group the nature shifts from the terrace into the group group is like a niche for the nature have you have you heard about this word niche we come across this in evolutionary biology usually niche refers to a small space away from the rest of the civilization for nature a uh, niche refers to an escape it's an escape from all the man made structures it is a small gap which is more dark which is more peaceful and more natural this is the last line of the poem it says lightning has nestled among the leaves a restless garden adrift go in your shadows cover this page this speaks about now here the rain has stopped it has stopped raining it it, sp it speaks about the aftermath of rain the after effect of rain lightning has nestled among the leaves like it, it was lightning perhaps but now there is no lightning because the lightning has gone back to its nests which is under the, uh, which is among the leaves it's taken shelter in the leaves a lightning has hit the tree and now it doesn't come back it's it's in the tree it's it's right there sleeping it's bed time for the lightning a restless garden adrift go in this refers to the soil erosion adrift means float float away float off a restless garden has calmly i mean when i say float off i mean uh, you know it's it's restless it's like a hyperactive kid you know you can't really make a kid sit down in a single place it just runs around you let it free you let a kid free he will just run around and you know enjoy his freedom similarly a restless garden has now floated off your shadows cover this page which means we are reading this poem perhaps our shadow is because we are reading this poem so after 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 analyzing all this finally we have come to a point we are able to understand this poem we are able to put our shadow on this page we are able to read this poem the theme of the poem uh, now i guess is very clear it's it speaks about rain but more intrinsically it speaks about nature it's trying to urge you to acquire the sensitivity to appreciate nature it wants the readers to look at nature appreciate it and you know uh, 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 be amused by it be, be amused by how good it is for us how healing and how curing it is for us the tone of the poem is very peaceful right it's very tranquilizing and it has got these words and sounds uh, you know uh, a very crisp kind of a sound a, a sound you know very uh, characteristic to this poem okay and all the words used here uh, it's got a very tranquilizing effect and I, i i spoke about a lot of them while i was discussing the poem the language there are a lot of poetic devices used personification is highly overloaded in the poem rain is literally personified to everything you could think of there's also repetition repetition is perhaps to calm us down you know make it sound more like a lullaby but also a repetition could be an emphasis listen to me as one listens to the rain the po the poet is urging us begging us to listen to him as one listens to the rain an emphasis as well as a very calming lullaby like uh, you know an effect and uh, there are other poetic devices as well there's simile you know there's alliteration and in you know, alliteration a lot with sounds and there's also sounds uh, there's onomatopoeia you know you can see certain sounds in the words right and and there is metaphors obviously metaphors and personification to a huge extent but perhaps the whole poem is an imagery because it's describing a very vivid picture which is very clearly visible to us 
the whole poetry could be think about uh, could be thought about as a picture a painting perhaps more than words words form a picture in this book so that was my take on uh, as one listens to the rain by octavio paz thank you